My name is Carol Palmer and I am the CBRL Director in Amman. Um, welcome very much to today's uh, webinar which is held in partnership with uh, the Palestine Exploration Fund and I'll be handing over to our colleague Felicity Cobbing from the Palestine Exploration Fund shortly. Um, but I just want to first of all give a short introduction to uh, CBRL to those who may not know us. Um, although I'm aware that many people in the audience today will be very familiar and this is a very popular topic, um, the CBRL and before it the British Institute for Archaeology and History had many projects um, in the uh, Eastern Badia and this lecture is really a follow-up on some of the latest research um, to come from the Eastern Badia. So CBRL is an independent UK research charity that exists to conduct, support and promote the humanities and social science research on the Levant or Levantine Middle East. We are one of the British Academy's eight uh, international research institutes, also called the BIRI, and we uh, receive a grant to, for our, to support our operations via the British Academy, but we are ever grateful to our members and friends whose donations and support in general enable us to do many projects and many additional things in Jordan and beyond. <laughs> Today we're focusing on Jordan. Uh, we have an office in London based at the British Academy and two institutes in the region. I'm speaking to you today from Amman and we have another institute in East Jerusalem, also known as the Kenyan Institute. Um, I also wanted to say before we begin, I understand we have some very special uh, guests with us today, if I may, in that uh, His Royal Highness Prince Hassan bin Talal and his, and his wife, Her Royal Highness Princess Savas El Hassan, are joining us today. Um, Prince Hassan has been a patron of the British Institute in Amman since our foundation in the 1970s, long-term supporter, and also a great promoter of research and development in the Badia. So uh, it's a great honor for us to be joined by Your Royal Highness today. And for all of us here, we hope that uh, on joining us, we hope that you enjoy today's webinar and that you will also join us for future events online or in person. So I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Felicity Cobbing, now from the Palestine Exploration Fund and uh, to continue the introductions. Uh, hello everybody, um, it's lovely to see so many of you here. My name is Felicity Cobbing. I'm the Chief Executive of the Palestine Exploration Fund, the PEF. We are based in Greenwich in London and we are the, the uh, oldest society for the study of the Levant uh, in the world. We were founded in 1865 and we support lots of projects such as the one which we're presenting today as well as uh, have a little museum if you want to come and look and we have a fantastic collection um, of archaeological material archives all connected with the work that we've done and other people have done in the Levant for the last 150 or so years. So once lockdown is over you're very welcome to come and visit us. Now today we're hearing from the Eastern Badia Pools Archaeological Project um, and we're uh, hearing from four of the contributors to that product, project. First of all, we're going to have York Rowan, who is Research Associate Professor of the, at the Oriental Institute of the University of Chicago. Um, and he is going to be followed up by um, Matt. Um, who is at the University of Nottingham, Professor Matt Jones. Um, and then we have um, Gary Rolleston, who is Professor Emeritus at Whitman College. And last of all, we have Alex, Alexander Vass. Uh, so without further ado, can I hand over now to York Rowan, uh, who is kicking things off. 
Thanks very much, Felicity, and thank you, Carol. Um, uh, and also, I wanted to thank Maggie at CBRL, CBRL, I believe, who set a lot of this up and is making sure that things run smoothly and, and uh, stick to time, perhaps, too. Um, as mentioned, my name is York Rowan. I'm at the University of Chicago. Um, I'm one of the co-directors of the Eastern Body Archaeological Project, which is sponsored by the University of Chicago with greatly appreciated funding from the Palestine Exploration Fund, the Brennan Foundation, uh, Whitman College, DePaul University, the Seven Pillars of Wisdom Trust, and private donors to a uh, fundraising effort on experiment.com. This project would not have been possible without the logistical and collegial support of the Department of Antiquities of the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. And so I want to emphasize that we really appreciate this. In addition, we received essential logistical support from the Royal Body of Forces of Jordan, the American Center of Oriental Research, the German Protestant Institute of Archaeology in Amman, the University of Nottingham, Dartmouth College, and Yede Tepe University, where Alex Wass is based. And we would like to emphasize our appreciation especially to the students and volunteers who've joined us to live and work in the challenging environment of the Black Desert that we're gonna look at today. Uh, the Eastern Bio Body Archaeological Project study area is uh, comprises a west, an east-west um, uh, transect across the, the part of the um, Black Desert, a southern part of the Eastern Body, just north of the Jordanian border with Saudi Arabia. Our survey and excavations have concentrated on two areas, Basad Pools and Wadi al Katafi. And over the past 10 years, we have recognized a striking and surprising presence of late Neolithic communities that provide evidence for a great amount of time and energy that people invested into building sturdy structures of basalt. In each of these areas, in Katafi and Basad Pools, our excavations indicate that these structures were used and reused by hunter herders although there are some differences between the two areas. So today, it's not possible to cover all of our results, and we can easily point those interested in publications um, about our research. Uh, we can point you to those very, very easily. Today, what we'd like to do is to highlight the environmental context for the people who occupied an area that seems so in inhospitable to most of us now. What were the environmental conditions like during the late Neolithic period? The dramatic increase in population attested by these many structures that you'll see in a moment come from, um, they're too numerous for local indigenous population growth. If that's the case, where did these people come from? Did they immigrate from the Western, more fertile and arable lands? Did they arrive from other regions as well, from Mesopotamia to the East or from the North? This brings us to another major question we wish to address today. What evidence is there for people arriving in the region and for their contact with other areas. Now, these are just a, but a few of the questions that our speakers hope to address today. Our first speaker, Dr. Matt Jones, is professor of quaternary science at the University of Nottingham, and he specializes in reconstructing past climate and environmental variability using physical and chemical sedimentary proxies. Matt works on projects in Jordan, Turkey, and Iran, so he's truly able to look at the macro and micro scales of environmental change. Our second speaker in the lineup is Dr. Gary Rolison. He's Emeritus Professor of Anthropology from Whitman College. Gary specializes in prehistory and lithic assemblages, and he's directed excavations at the Neolithic mega site of Ain Ghazal, which is just to mention one of the sites for which he's well known. Our third speaker is Dr. Alexander Wass, uh, lecturer at Yede Tepe University in Istanbul. Alex is also a prehistorian with a specialization in animal bones and experience its sites across the Eastern Mediterranean and North Africa. So after our speakers, we plan to have ample time, as Carol mentioned, for questions and answers. And so without any further ado, I'd like to hand it off to uh, our first speaker, Dr. Matt Jones. Matt? Thanks, York. Uh, hopefully you can all see me and uh, on my screen. York's nothing, so I'll take that as an affirmative. So uh, hello. Uh, and I just add my thanks uh, particularly to the CBRL and the PEF for organising today's event and thank you all for coming. Um, so to start then, um, as York said, I'm a quaternary scientist, so uh, my interest, uh, my research interests are particularly in uh, reconstructing water availability and how that changes through time and in particular how it's changed through, through the Holocene, so the last 11 and a half thousand years or so. And so I wanted to start uh, really 
with this image and thinking about water as a key, if not the key ingredient for producing a, a green or at least a, a greener desert during the late Neolithic. And if you, you can see the image here, uh, there's, there's hints of green in, in the Wadi al um during one of um, the Eastern Wadi Agricultural Project's uh, field seasons in sort of late springtime. Um, but maybe not enough to, to consider this a fully green desert as yet. So if we start uh, then by trying to look at, uh, at the region the, more broadly of, of Southwest Asia, uh, and thinking about where that water uh, might have come from, um, and using the present day as, as a context of where uh, water tends to come from um, today. So you can ignore all the little dots and um, symbols on this map um, for now, uh, and just maybe concentrate on these plots of um, the local uh, sort of average weather conditions, both precipitation in the bars and temperature um, in these gray lines for, for different places across the broader region. And in general, um, we see this sort of classic pattern of um, wet winters and, and dry summers, um, unless um, you're far down here um, in the southeast, um, where that temporal pattern changes as we see more influence of uh, summer rainfall um, associated with the Indian monsoon systems. Um, this, the more standard uh, winter rainfall uh, tends to come from uh, storm traps coming through the Mediterranean from um, the North Atlantic and into the region. It's also probably worth noting at this point that there's also occasional rains uh, from air masses that come across North Africa and pick up moisture um, in the Red Sea. So this is sort of the major timings uh, of um, rainfall across the region and you can see um, our study sites of focus today um, symbolised by these two markers here in the middle of the map. Um, if we look slightly more locally um, then we can um, look at rainfall um, across Jordan itself. Um, and really to note the strong uh, uh, rainfall gradient that exists uh, across present day Jordan. Um, and you can see from the spatial sort of variability of this rainfall, this is really winter rainfall driven by those um, storm tracks coming in um, off the Mediterranean. And part of this rainfall pattern and this rainfall gradient is linked to the general topography as well of Jordan. So, this strong gradient from quite high values over 500 millimetres a year into really arid conditions of less than 50 millimetres of rainfall a year um, for our uh, area of interest today uh, within almost less than 100 kilometres um, due to sort of really a rain out and rain shadow effect from the high ground just to the east of the Dead Sea Basin down here. In terms of time again we see this sort of classic winter rainfall dominated and this is uh, data, average data uh, for the period 1943 to 2005 from the, the town of Safawi um, out in the eastern Bardia. And, and you can see the pattern. We can also see maybe from the error bars that this is quite noisy data with a lot of variability. And if we look at that in a bit more detail, um, here's just a, a snapshot of 20 years of that record between 1943 and 1962. And you can see that. You know, some years are, are very dry and there's very little rainfall at all. Look at 1948, for example, and other years um, are particularly wet. Um, and the timings of the, the really heavy rainfall, it's not always uh, consistent either. So it might normally be in sort of the November to January period, but occasionally you might get a very wet March. And the timing and the amount of, of this rainfall is really important for how green um, that desert or the vegetation that is allowed to grow in that particular part um, of the Bardia. So the predictability of the rainfall um, and its timing are really important in terms of how vegetation will respond to the arrival of that rainfall today at any present time. It's an important thing to keep in mind when we think about conditions in the past as well. If we go back to our, our map of Southwest Asia and we start to think about the period um, in question today, so the late Neolithic, and I'm going to 
focus uh, for my part of the presentation at least on this period nine to seven thousand years before present or seven to five thousand years before the common era um, so how does the rest of, uh, of southwest asia look at, at that time and what can that tell us about what we might expect um these Jimbardi to have been like how green may it have been and we and we can look at evidence from around the region i was going to start maybe um sort of the classic region when you talk about green areas traditionally the green sahara um which is taught, discussed at, at length for this sort of early to, to mid holocene period uh, and looking at evidence uh, archaeological and geological um through that period nine to seven thousand years before present um still a generally uh, so-called green sahara we move slightly east uh, and move over to the Arabian Peninsula. Again, look at some of the evidence from there. And, and this figure is from a recent paper discussing some of the, the lake sediment records in the north of Arabia. And this, uh, if we look, I'm going to read these out because you might not be able to read them, but the, the time, time of lake, which is L12 on the map here, um, is described as a deep water lake at 9000 um, BP. And this is part really of this, uh, what's referred to as the Holocene humid period often um, in Arabia. I'm not a big fan of this particular um, term as, as humidity is a, a particular meteorological variable that's very difficult for proxies to record, uh, but I'll spare you that tirade for today. Um, so we move, uh, move north uh, again and we look at um, Turkey, so Anatolia, this is some work um, I did with Neil Roberts and others quite a, year, quite a few years ago now. Um, but again, so just showing that this particularly early Holocene time period was generally wetter and more precipitation um, falling over Anatolia in the early Holocenes, particularly compared to present day. And this was work based on uh, records that came from, from isotope records, uh, from like stable isotope records of oxygen uh, preserved in lake sediment records. And that pattern um, also comes out um, in the records from uh, lakes in um, the Zagros in Iran, so from lakes like Miribad and Zobar. But not all the environmental proxies preserved in these lakes change at the same time. And so we have still what some people would describe as a precipitation paradox in the early Holocene, where the isotope data show a really quick and rapid uh, response to global changes at the beginning of the Holocene and seems to suggest a, a wetter environment. Whereas particularly the, the tree pollen in, in these regions seems to have taken a lot longer to get, in, uh, to get going. And this might, in some respects, suggest a, a drier climate, which is where the paradox comes from. So there's different ways of trying to understand that and, and there's no particular final answer. But it, if you think that um, during the early Holocene, it's likely rainfall seems to be stronger in most places. So it's stronger coming in from the Mediterranean. It's also stronger coming in from the Indian monsoon system. Uh, these ones probably in the winter and these ones probably in the summer. And associated with these summer rains are high pressure systems that will cause drier summers in, in certain parts of the region. So the interaction between those things somehow comes together to create what in general looks a much greener environment in this sort of early to mid Holocene period. What's going on here in our particular sites of interest for today is still slightly um, unknown. And you'll notice the big lack of dots on this map, which was from a review we did a couple of years ago now, uh, showing the complete lack of paleo environmental evidence in terms of these questions for this part of the world. Sort of a segue into our, our own study sites then. The other thing really to think about and, and to be sure of when we're thinking about how, how wet these environments were and how in turn that led to, to maybe a green, more green environment or a greener environment, is how that rainfall then gets into different parts of the landscape, be it on the surface or, or through groundwater and the delays or the potential delays that can have then on, on rainfall getting through to the system to be of use by vegetation or by animals or, or maybe directly by people. And I think from what we've seen so far, it's, it's likely that um, in the parts of the world we're talking about today, in this particular part of what is now Eastern Jordan, that it's likely that surface water were the dominant um, sources of water um, in the landscape. 
And so what we've been trying to do um, for our particular, for the Eastern Bardi Archaeological Project is trying to understand how those wa that water might have got towards or, or even stayed in the landscapes that, that people were living in at this particular time and for how long and maybe for in what times of the year. I just wanted to really acknowledge um, these people that have helped out, particularly with the fieldwork on the environmental side over the last um, few years. So some undergraduate students, Haroon Ikram and Richard Mason from Nottingham, um, our DOA rep and colleague, Wassam Al Said from, from Azraq, and uh, one of my current PhD students, Amit Pashlefat. So many thanks to them. So what we've been trying to do and starting to do in this landscape is to try and understand one, if there was more water, how might have it sort of interacted with the landscape and how people may have interacted with it um, in the past. And this is just an aerial view at the same scale of the two sites that we've been looking at. So Wissard pools themselves are in here in this maybe just be able to pick out a narrow wadi system um, moving or moving water between two relatively uh, flatter plains in the landscape with, with a car system at the bottom, so a plier dry lake system at the bottom of the wadi system. And here is the wadi al Qatafi with a large car at the, bot, uh, at the top of the, of the local system we've been looking at as part of this project. And what we've been trying to do is understand these systems at various scales. So uh, firstly, a very coarse uh, sort of scale, how much sediment are in these basins? How old is that sediment? And what can that tell us about what the landscape might have looked like, you know, seven, nine thousand years or so ago? So this is um, a, a big hole that was dug in in the car at the bottom of, the, of Wissard Pools uh, to try and capture water in, in the present day. Uh, it allowed us to get at uh, pretty much a, a full sequence through the, through the sediments in this particular location. There's about three metres of sediment in the car at the bottom of the pools. And our initial dating show that about 50 centimetres down through this sequence, you're at about 8,000 years ago. So about the time period we're, we're looking at. And at the very bottom, uh, the dates are really old, um, sort of beyond the, the OSL technique we're using. So not major changes in the landscape. And if you look at the, um, the car at the top of the Wadi Al Qatafi or the bit of it that we've been working in, um, there's quite a change in what is quite a flat car surface today. There's quite a gradient in the subsurface. So the sediments are only a, a metre or so deep here on the eastern side of it, whereas at, at this side, of the, at the western side, sediments get to three metres or beyond. So there's, there's a different shape of the land surface sort of hidden below some of these car that might mean the landscape looked uh, slightly different. Um, in, in the past and, and might have had implications for how much water these different basins might have held in the past. And we're still looking into uh, the dating for this particular one, the samples are in the lab as we speak. We're also trying to understand things in a bit more detail, uh, both the topography of these systems so we can get a hand, better handle on how water, if it does flow, might, might move through and how much water might flow through these systems, how much uh, water can they hold if water if more water falls uh, and for how long that might water might stay in the environment uh, seasonality as i talked about earlier on is a big question about when the water when rain falls how long it stays around is key to how green um, an environment this can produce one of the surprising things in in the car wissad sediments in particular was we've found pretty good pollen preservation and this links directly then to, to questions of vegetation in the region. And we know we've got sediment that's the same age as the archaeology that you're going to hear about shortly. Um, there's, there's issues around the preservation of pollen environments like this and how far it's travelled and, and what it actually tells us and how local a signal it is. But it's a, it's a tantalising glimpse of, of something quite different um, than what we see today and links nicely to, to find on the archaeological sites themselves, such as from, from charcoal. To, to help us start to build a more complete picture of what the environments were like at these sites. So I'm going to stop there and pass on to Gary, I think. One of the things I'd like to discuss is a phenomenal change in terms of population size, in terms of absolute size, and also in terms of population density. Um, as you can see from this uh, slide, uh, there's not an awful lot of indication of uh, 
dense populations out here. Um, um, even today, there are not an awful lot of Bedouin out there. I think the number of de Bedouin uh, herders has been reduced considerably, especially in the last uh, 20 or 30 years. Um, we're located in what's called the Harut uh, volcanic field, uh, very dense um, volcanic uh, flood uh, deposits. Um, and the two sites we're working on are on either side of this uh, uh, Harut Sham. And one of the things that makes the Harut Sham especially interesting is because when you compare it to the limestone um, areas on either side, um, the Harut Sham has got many more microhabitats. And with that, those microhabitats, it also has a more diverse flora, which introduces a more diverse fauna. And in addition to that, one, one of the things that makes the Black Desert so popular, especially during uh, this late Neolithic period, um, it has more diverse resources than the Hamad, especially in terms of flint and basalt for making tools for hunting or for grinding uh, uh, different kinds of materials. Now, if we look at sort of guesses of what the PPNA or what the, the Neolithic period looked like in terms of occupation out in the, in the Eastern Desert. Um, during the pre-pottery Neolithic A period from 10,000 to about 8,600 BC, um, I know of only one semi-permanent site um, in the Safawi area being excavated by Tobias Richter. Um, but other than that, there's very little good evidence of any people out there at all during the PPNA period. Uh, but I think that's probably uh, the result of um, sort of a, a lot of um, deposits may have accumulated over earlier uh, occupations and they're hard to find. During the PPMB, uh, the pre-pottery Neolithic B, um, I think almost all of the surveys that were done by Allison Betts and by uh, Alex Wass and me um, and uh, others, that the, the pattern hasn't changed very much. Uh, again, one semi-permanent site was excavated at Duela, um, but otherwise it looks like it's mostly very small, short-term ephemeral camps used by very uh, small groups uh, moving on a, on a very rapid uh, pace. In the PPNC period from 7,000 to 6,500 BC, um, the pattern is beginning to change. We know of two semi-permanent um, uh, residences in the Wadi Jalat that was excavated by, that were excavated by Andrew Gerard and his group, um, but they're still very small, maybe one to two or three uh, buildings and they appear to have been occupied for a very short period of time. But in the late Neolithic, from 6,500 up to 5,000 BC, we see a massive increase in population that simply can't be um, accounted for by normal uh, population growth. Um, and certainly this involves bringing in uh, populations from the West, uh, from Palestine and Jordan in the, in the agricultural areas, probably from uh, central and southern uh, Syria, and probably from Mesopotamia as well. Um, and I'd like to give some examples of the densities that we're talking about here. Wasad Pools is known because of these numbered pools in this very short wadi. It's only about a kilometer uh, long, and it only goes about eight meters in depth from this area at the head of the wadi down to a playa where there is a separate um, Neolithic village down here. Um, the water uh, that can be stored in here, we haven't been able to figure out everything, but in pool number one, we were able to measure uh, that, that pool at its, um, at its uh, height 
would have captured 2,500 um, uh, cubic meters of water. Um, the, there is epipaleolithic material also found in the area here. So this has been a long-term attraction for hunters um, and for hunters and herders. Um, here you can see some of the um, structures that were built and maintained for fairly long periods of time. Uh, this is only a small uh, fraction of what we began to document using uh, theodolite. Now, uh, using drones and kites, uh, we can do this work an awful lot uh, more frequent. But on a survey that we did in, in 2008, um, we found, we estimated that we probably had 300 to 400 buildings that were not major tombs and not uh, animal pens. Um, but uh, looking at, again, David Kennedy's uh, aerial photographs, I think this is probably an underestimate by at least 100 buildings, if not 200. Um, the amount of time that was spent at some of these um, uh, gigantic mega sites uh, during the late Neolithic uh, certainly shows that it goes from the beginning of the late Neolithic at 6,500 all the way up to the end, the final late Neolithic, um, as is uh, demonstrated by this uh, sort of uh, uh, signal of a different uh, group of people. Uh, here we have large animal enclosures attached to small rectangular huts. Um, and this is pretty characteristic of the uh, final late Neolithic. We have these both at Uvasad pools and at the Wadi of Katafi. At Katafi at uh, Mesa 4, Maitland's Mesa, we had a C14 date of 6,400 BC. Here is the Wadi of Katafi and the Mesas from a Google Earth map. This is Mesa number four and Mesa number seven. Uh, where we've done work um, over the years. Uh, again, the original uh, estimate of 600 buildings um, based on uh, David Kennedy's photographs uh, was 600 uh, buildings. But again, uh, I've re-examined um, David Kennedy's um, uh, aerial photographs and we underestimated, I underestimated this again, probably by 100 um, uh, buildings. Here you can see at Mason number seven, where we uh, were excavating in uh, 2013 and 14, no, 2015 and 16. You can see again, the density of buildings at the base of Mesa seven, and here's a little bit at the base of Mesa number five. Mesa number seven itself had a, uh, an astounding total of 287 structures. Here's Mesa seven again, the Mesa five and Mesa six. Um, all together around these three mesas and Mesa 8, which is below the bottom of the, the, uh, uh, the image, um, uh, well over 500 structures, uh, just at this one uh, location here. Now, the structures based on aerial photo, I mean, drone photos that we uh, undertook in 2013, all the way up to 2000 and 18 or something, um, it's clear that those buildings are not randomly distributed, but instead they're clustered into what might represent uh, extended families that um, have come together uh, during an aggregate aggregation period, uh, perhaps during the summer time. One of those clusters is the SS1, the South Slope 1 cluster, and we have the excavated SS1 building itself, um, which appears to be an atelier where there are an awful lot of uh, hearths in this part of a partially covered building where an awful lot of different kinds of activities were probably uh, undertaken and that the other SS numbers out here, uh, SS2 to SS6, may have been sleeping quarters for the um, extended family members uh, who stayed here for a couple of uh, two or three long periods of repeated uh, occupation. Now, these two 
uh, aggregation centers, the mesas and Usad duels, are by no means the only ones um, in the eastern Badia. Based on uh, Google Earth images, um, David Kennedy was able to identify a, a cairn field very similar to what we see at uh, the mesas and Usad people up there, uh, Usad pools. Uh, with dense concentrations of buildings and animal pens. Another one that he called, David Kennedy called, uh, Cairnfield One, and then uh, Hussein Cairnfield up here, about 50 kilometers north of uh, Wasad Pools. So what appears to be the case is that we have seasonal aggregation, number four down here, where people came to the uh, semi-permanent water resources available in the wadi um, and in the pools at uh, the mesas and the side pools. Um, overall, there was a wetter climate. We can tell that uh, from the pollen that uh, Matt and his students uh, were able to identify. There was lusher vegetation uh, throughout the, the immediate vicinity anyway. Uh, vegetation that lasted much longer because of a topsoil that no longer exists out there that absorbed the water. Um, there was a new economy, the hunters as uh, in previous times, but also the addition of um, sheep and goat uh, domestication that probably provided dairy uh, more importantly than meat or skins. And then there was a new technology uh, the construction of these kites, uh, 1,400 kites were constructed in the Badia, not all at the same time, obviously, um, but these kites allowed mass uh, slaughter of gazelle that certainly provided a lot of meat. Whoops. Uh, it just di died. Um, um, but in any event, this all probably represents um, what was very important for this uh, major increase in population out there. So it's up to you, um, uh, Alex. Okay, so back in uh, 2002, um, when um, Gary and I bumped up the access track to Wissad Pools for the first time, it's fair to say that we looked out upon the spectacular archaeological vista um, through Eingazal tinted spectacles. Even though the work of Andrew Garrard and Alison Betts had forewarned us of the existence of an indigenous, late Neolithic, hunter forager herder culture in Jordan's eastern Bardia, um, it remains the case that on that stifling summer's evening, the cultural compass within my knackered Land Rover pointed resolutely west, um, back towards the Mediterranean zone hill country whence we'd come. The possibility that that desolate spot in the Black Desert might once have heard talk of the great rivers in the east with reed boat traffic upon them that plied from within sight of the Taurus Mountains to the Indian Ocean, never crossed my mind. Since then, how very much has changed. As time this afternoon is short, I wish to focus on two issues only. First, the origins and expansion of what we refer to as the Black Desert Neolithic Cultural Complex, and second, the emerging evidence for its um, links with Mesopotamia, as well as with the Levant and Arabian Peninsula. Until recently, the Neolithic archaeology of Eastern Jordan has tended to be viewed through the prism of village-based cultural complexes of the Mediterranean zone to the west. And this has long felt unsatisfactory. First, it's an unwarranted projection of modern political boundaries and transport infrastructure onto the uh, prehistoric um, archaeological record. And second, considering the Badia in terms of how it's similar to or different from the hill country, requires us to think in terms of it being the divergent periphery of a normative core. And this implies a, a, a set direction of, of, of cultural influence or movement, um, which may be misleading. And in my view, the Neolithic archaeological record of the Hara is sufficiently distinctive to warrant definition on its own terms, the Black Desert Neolithic, or BDN. And in its developed late Neolithic form, the BDN consisted of an expansive site hierarchy, um, as, as Gary mentioned, dominated by substantial aggregation sites within the Hara or on its margins, and these were surrounded at distances of tens or even hundreds of kilometers by Buran Neolithic herding camps, hunting camps, and desert kite hun uh, hunting traps, um, upon which at least part of the population was seasonally dispersed. 
And I'd like to emphasize a couple of points regarding this cultural complex. First, I believe its roots are to be found in early PPMB traditions and practices documented at stepic margin sites, such as Jilat 7, Mashash 163, and Harad Jahira uh, um, uh, 202. Almost all of the architectural characteristics of the BDN, irregular curvilinear architecture, standing stones, alcoves, forecourts and windbreaks, the use of irregular upright slabs to line structures are already present on these very much earlier sites. I'd also like to draw your attention to an incised stone, uh, limestone plaque from a nicely stratified late Neolithic context at, um, with Sad Pools. And this evokes late PPMA, early PPMB comparanda more than it does, for example, the late Neolithic incised pebbles of Shah Golan and elsewhere. And the same might be said of the mighty cup hole grinding slabs that we found in such quantity at the Sad Pools. And further evidence for continuity of behaviour from the early PPMB all the way through to the late Neolithic was discovered in our 2019 field season. And this took the form of large tabular flint knives pressed hard up against the internal perimeter wall of the structure at uh, regular intervals within the constructional uh, um, makeup of an interior bench. And near identical behaviour using sickles and arrowhead blanks was documented at early PPMB communal building EA53, for example, at no lesser site than Jafal Ahmad. Turning to my second point, I believe that BDN groups were probably involved in herding, most likely focused on milk production, from much earlier than the limited post-mortem representation of caprine bones in their very attenuated fauna, uh, faunal assemblages might suggest. And the critical orthodoxy suggests that herding wasn't adopted in the steppe until the earliest, earlier seventh millennium. However, this doesn't take into account the presence of very substantial numbers of uh, domestic goats and sheep at Bawab al Ghazal in the Azraq Basin by the later 8th millennium, and in the Syrian steppe, Tel Qum, uh, too, by the end of that millennium. And as Gary said, when, when considering the demographic success of the BDM, we must consider the possibility that its expansion was fueled uh, in situ, perhaps, by an intensifying codependence between the herd herding of caprines for milk and hunting of game for meat perhaps from as early as the mid 8th millennium onwards. And so in combination with climatically driven grassland expansion, such innovations may have exerted a pull on black desert demographics, sufficient to account for a good deal of their late Neolithic expansion, over which possibly uh, um, in migration by herders from the West may be led. The next part of the discussion will focus primarily on material from structure W80 at that crossroads on the steppe were said pools. Its crossroads status is no surprise if we recall the geographical factors that determine natural routes across the region. Foremost amongst these is the fact that the water sources along the eastern margins of the Hara, were said pools amongst them, form um, like a miniature version of the Great Lakes of East Africa, uh, a seasonally glittering chain leading from Jelf uh, on the northern edge of the Great Nafud up into the Syrian desert. And at intervals, this is cut by the upper reaches of the Wadian drainages that lead directly to the Euphrates River. And although much of the late Neolithic material uh, from W80 conforms to Southern Levantine norms, evidence for cultural links with Mesopotamia has recently come into sharper focus. We may start with a cluster of unbaked spherical clay tokens. To pick just one of innumerable uh, Upper Mesopotamian uh, comparanda, these objects have direct parallels at exactly contemporary Tel Sabiabia, where they've been interpreted as administrative tools associated with counting, information storage, or, or perhaps complex calculation. And this is interesting, for it begs the question of what was being administered all the way out at Wasab, and by whom and why. And my personal belief is that milk-based foodstuffs or wool are perhaps the most likely candidates. And to these clay uh, 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 tokens might be added what we refer to as gizzard stones, rounded little quartzite pebbles of which approximately 50 have now been recovered from inside W80, frequently in um, discrete clusters. And their function remained elusive until the discovery in 2019 of a clearly shaped quarter gizzard stone. And as three quarter half and quarter spheres are part of the wider Mesopotamian clay token corpus, we may propose um, that our gizzard stones perhaps fulfilled uh, a comparable function. 
And I turn now uh, to one of the uh, most intriguing objects yielded up by uh, um, W80, uh, and you see it here at the bottom left. And it's a large um, perforated plaque, or link, mother of pearl. And a similar object, likewise dated to around 6400, 5700 BC, was recovered from level A5 at El Kun II, which hints at the probable existence of extensive Cambodia networks at this time. And broadly comparable objects have also been found at the somewhat later site of Asibia H3 in Kuwait, at the bottom end of the Tigris-Euphrates river system. And this lends support to Rob Carter's uh, thesis that the sixth millennium in particular saw, and I quote, a growing exploitation of marine and inland waterways. And we must therefore be alive to the possibility um, that seasonally dispersed elements of the Black Desert Neolithic would have camped on the banks of the most important riverine artery of the late Neolithic world. And as an aside, these mother of pearl objects are comparable in form and likely function to the similarly iridescent polished obsidian links from Halaf sites, including Domas Tepe and the burnt house of Arpachia. Other objects that seem tied to cultural practices originating in Mesopotamia include um, polished stone spheres, an incised stone cone, uh, a possible labyrinth, and a bone spatula. Uh, and, and regarding the spheres, Denis Mabesarak argued some time ago that highly worked stone tokens appear very much later than clay examples in Mesopotamia and Iran, um, being primarily associated with the period 6500 to 5000 BC. And this is a very good match with our situation, as is her observation that they tended to be made as you can see on hard, durable and colourful raw materials that would uh, take an attractive polish. And she proposed that these stone tokens may have had a different function to clay ones, perhaps as markers of personal identity. Now, to conclude, the premise of our thesis um, is that between 6700 and 6000 BC, climate change, change moved the frontier for successful pastoralism further to the south and east, with the expansion of grassland deep into the Arabian Peninsula. And this allowed hunter-forager herders of the Black Desert Neolithic first to consolidate their presence in what Sven Helms described as an island in a sea of deserts at the apex of Arabia, that being the project study area, and second to incorporate territory unsuitable for agriculture within the Neolithic productive economy by means of pastoralism. And by the later seventh and especially sixth millennium, the world beyond the Harap was witnessing more intensive production uh, and trade and exchange and connectivity than previously. And all of this laid the foundations for subsequent processes of early state formation. And there is now evidence to suggest that the people of the Black Desert Neolithic were not just aware of events unfolding beyond their immediate um, horizon. Um, to some extent, they seem also to have been active participants, adhering to their own deeply rooted cultural traditions, whilst remaining open and receptive to outside influences. And we may note that Peter McGee has described just such a blend of local and foreign elements as being one of the hallmarks of the Arabian Neolithic. Now, whilst the exact mechanisms by which interaction between the Western and Eastern wings of the fertile, um, of the fertile present um, remain elusive, the Black Desert Neolithic may have played a role in that process. And the time has surely come when we can no longer dismiss the similarity between Yarmoukian, coffee bean or carry-eyed figurines and those of late Neolithic Mesopotamia as coincidence or independent invention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to um, all our speakers for their individual uh, takes on the on, uh, on the greenness um, of the Black Desert and how it changed during this period. I'd like to invite our audience to ask questions in the Q&A. I will um, read out names unless you say otherwise. Um, and uh, we can now start the discussion part of uh, this evening, this afternoon, if you're in the UK, his uh, uh, presentation. Um, I myself, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm particularly intrigued, if I may ask uh, Alex, about the Mesopotamian links that you're highlighting, uh, highlighting there. I, 
uh, I've uh, I've never seen that before. This may be my um, this may be my uh, lack of, of knowledge or, or your recent uh, results. But could you sort of say a little bit more, Alex, about um, such strong links to to Mesopotamia that you are saying is connected by the material culture here, and potentially, if I understood you correctly, some quite long migrations that are involved in that? Let me unmute. Um, yeah, sure. Um, the, the, so the important thing um, to bear in mind, it, it, it's not that um, uh, sites like Wasad are, are Mesopotamian sites. Um, I, I would describe them as crossroads sites, uh, and, and they draw in uh, um, uh, cultural influences from all points of the compass. Um, a great deal is coming um, from the Levant, uh, the southern Levant. Um, some is coming from the north. Um, even some is coming up from Arabia as well. Um, and and what, what I would um, propose is, is that it's the um, development of herding um, networks in particular um, that formed um, the vectors, if you like, of some of this um, late Neolithic um, connectivity. Um, and this, uh, th th there is no reason to suppose that this would not have been um, over um, quite long distances. Uh, so, so certainly um, the material culture that we're getting is, is coming in from all points of the compass, um, uh, from, from quite a long way away. So it's the development of, of uh, herding. How long has the Eastern Badia project been going on? for now as well. Um, you've been excavate, you've been interested in this region for nearly 20 years, it seems, the team in different ways and more. In, in, in its current iteration, uh, um, the, the project started in 2008. Okay, all right. <laughs> 2000, okay. Yeah. We're still chipping away at it. Chipping away at it. I know that you'd intended to be, to be out there um, uh, this year, but other other things uh, intervened as well. Okay, we've got some questions coming in now. So, um, from Abdullah Al Sharif, um, I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, we have the question to the team: How do you see the extension of Neolithic post Neolithic communities in North Saudi Saudi Arabia, as inferred from satellite images? So pushing there to connect uh, uh, patterns that have been observed in Saudi Arabia with what we can see in the Jordanian Hara Sham. Do, would one of our speakers like to speak to that? <laughs> Do we have volunteers? I can say something about that. Um, in terms of looking at, um, oh, start my video. Um, in terms of looking at Google Earth material, at um, some of the stuff that uh, David Kennedy was publishing on his work in South, northern Saudi Arabia, and on a visit I made about a year ago, um, I don't even remember, April 2019, I think, um, there are an awful lot of areas in the food area. And I can't, uh, can't really say anything more except the food um, that look like there were permanent villages, undoubtedly occupied by groups that had um, domesticated uh, caprines um, that were made of, uh, to my mind, of um, sort of dried mud walls. Uh, not mud brick, but uh, pizze probably. Um, but one of the problems of doing this kind of research is there's no way to date these things. And especially, uh, as far as I know, nobody's ever excavated any of these um, permanent villages. So uh, we might be looking at something that's only 1900 years old, or we might be looking at something that's Neolithic. It's difficult to say. Another question from Martha Helander, um, who's asking about the standing stones um, that were mentioned and, and pictured. Um, in what context were they found? 
um, were some structures identifiable as devoted to ritual use and what features did they have? Alex, that's yours. <laughs> okay, um, so, so, so um, uh, the great majority of the sites, uh, of the structures for which we have information um, contain a central standing stone. And some structures, uh, uh, for example, um, M7SS1 um, that you saw uh, Gary uh, show a very nice photograph of. Um, they then have uh, um, uh, uh, peripheral standing stones. Now, SS1 uh, is interesting um, because its standing stones are, are, are located um, perpendicularly to, to each other. They're kind of a, a regular 90 degree angles. Um, now, one possibility is um, that the standing stones um, supported a roof. Um, and, and we have some evidence uh, in, in, in the form of the uh, site formation processes um, to suggest that at least uh, uh, um, some structures were partially moved. Um, but that's not all of the story. Um, for at the base of uh, um, the standing stone at, for example, W80 in particular, um, th th there's um, episodes of structured deposition at the base of that standing stone. Um, so. so um, we found uh, in its immediate vicinity uh, uh, um, uh, kind of foundation deposits, if you like, of, of um, gazelle um, mandibles um, tucked on, on, onto the floor at the base of the stone. Uh, um, the uh, nice um, uh, bone spatula was found in that location as well. Um, there were uh, um, uh, a cache of uh, um, caprine, uh, primarily caprine astragaly, um, were also found there. Um, so, so, so it, it's not purely functional. One, one other um, uh, thing to bear in mind is, is that we've excavated structures of varying sizes. Now, um, in all cases um, that we've got information for, the pillar is central, or, or in the majority of cases the pillar is central, regardless of the span um, that is to be roofed. Okay, uh, and, and one might expect um, that in a, a very large structure, um, you might have a, a, a different arrangement of standing stones to take into account this very large span, um, but that seems not to be the case. So, so it's a mixed bag, in, in short. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think this next one is a question for um, Matt by coming from Sigrid Osborne. Um, what type of vegetation does the pollen reveal for the Neolithic? Is it mostly grassland? I, yeah, it's, um, I preface this by saying all oh, this is quite um, preliminary, so I'm not going to put my house on this. But um, yeah, the, um, at the moment, soon, maybe. But the, yeah, it's mostly grassland and shrubland, but there, are, there is uh, tree pollen as well, uh, small amounts. Um, and so, which is... Um, Quite intriguing and um, we also see um, wood charcoal on the sites themselves so um, there is wood around as I say when I, as I said in the talk it's the taphonomy of this pollen like how it gets into the car is still quite an interesting question it's not straightforward sometimes in these environments but there is tree pollen in there as well uh, and there is evidence of trees from the charcoal on the site so um, there's a it's a tantalising glimpse of, of something, yeah, which might resemble a bit more than a grassland, which I think, I mean, I, I don't know, Gary might be uh, push this a bit further than I would and be a slightly less <laughs> conservative in, in my interpretation of the data, but um, he's smiling, so I think that's a yes. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm trying to push it as far as possible. Um, I mean, when you look at the pollen of lemno, which is duckweed, um, you're talking about a marsh. And when you find typha um, or bulrushes, that's a marsh. Or if you're looking at, um, well, I'll just do with those two. Um, there must have been standing stagnant water for long periods of time. And lemna and typha pollen doesn't move. Um, it's all waterborne pollen um, or mostly waterborne pollen. So you don't have to worry. You know, we um, there was pine pollen found. Now that can travel for hundreds of kilometers because uh, it's got wings on it. Um, oak pollen doesn't travel very far. Certainly not uh, more than ten kilometers at at, uh, at the most. 
Um, so I would say that, and the same thing with, um, uh, well, I can't remember the, the species name. That's all right. It doesn't make any difference. But I think there probably was um, a marshy environment, at least along Kawasad, if not um, along most of those big Kaws. Um, and I think that would have made a major difference in terms of resources available to these people, uh, not just for food. I mean, you can grind up uh, typha roots um, into a powder that can be treated like flour, so that you could make bread out of this stuff. Um, oak trees, we had um, a lot of, we had oak pollen, I mean, oak charcoal um, of uh, Corcus ithaburensis, which is a tremendous um, acorn producer. And acorns are rich in calories, oils, fats, whatever it is, um, as long as you can get rid of the tannins that are in the, uh, the, the, the nut itself. And I think that might explain what the, these large grinding stones, cup hole grinding stones may have been associated with is processing acorns as a dietary uh, uh, sort of staple. Um, so I think probably the landscape looked, not only looked very much different, it was very different. Um, and yeah, well, anyway, I pushed this envelope as much as I can, I suppose. So th that's my view when I, when I saw those things. Sticking with the environment, we have uh, Paul Breeze, who thanks everybody for their great talks. And again, going back to Matt, uh, who mentioned there is some data emerging from the car in relation to water persistence and seasonality. Uh, given the position of the bad year, this is really interesting. Can you say anything more on this and the level of moisture receipt and greening you are seeing from the car record? That's Matt, huh? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, I can't, we can't put numbers on it yet. And I think, I think the, the really interesting thing at the moment for us is that these, these basins look like they, they've got quite a lot of Holocene sediment in them. And I think that was quite a surprise, which suggests that they, they were probably all of them, most of the ones we've looked at, and not just these two that we talked about today, had more space to hold, hold water um, in the early Holocene. And, this is, this is quite interesting and there's evidence that that was probably definitely, almost like, definitely likely. <laughs> That's about as good as the paleo scientist gets, I think. <laughs> um, um, for, for other sites, I mean, there's people from the Shabaker project on here who can talk about this in more detail, but you know, where there's, there's wider evidence for, for probably deeper water for longer time. I mean, we know even today, some of these sites can hold up to half a metre of water for a month or so. So, and it, we just wonder how far we have to push the, the inputs and the outputs in terms of winter rainfall and, and summer evaporation to keep quite a significant more amounts of water in, in these systems for, for probably, you know, quite a bit longer in time. So we're, that's why getting a handle on the size of these basins, their morphology and the subsurface as well as what they look like today is, is important to try and get reasonable numbers to put into some models of that. I think we're always going to rely to some degree on, on modeling these systems and, and narrowing down the potential scenarios for water availability at these sites with, with what we found so far uh, from a water point of view. I think that skirts around your question a little bit, but um, that's my answer for today. <laughs> Hopefully a bit more in a year or so's time. Um, getting quite a lot of questions coming, <laughs> coming in now and I'm aware we're starting to run a little bit out of time, but I'm going to go to um, our friend and colleague, Professor Zaidan Kafafi, <laughs> who said hello to everybody, hi friends. And he, he said, thanks a lot. And may I remind Alex of the Yamukian pottery sherds excavated at Wissad, which also indicated the relationship between Mesopotamia and the south of the Levant. And he goes on to say, can we consider that the late Neolithic in the Black Desert consists 
of the basis for the Jawa culture in the early Bronze Age. Alex, I think. <laughs> yeah, uh, um, th 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 thank you very much. Um, yeah, it's, it's, tr it's, it's true to say um, that, that we do have um, some uh, Yarmoukian uh, pottery at Wissau. Um, so, so, so clearly, uh, um, as I said, you know, stuff's coming in from all points of the compass and, and I, 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 we might posit um, that, that the Black Desert Neolithic was uh, a conduit for trans-stepic links between, between the southern Levant and, and Mesopotamia. Um, so, so with regard to whether um, the late Neolithic uh, uh, cultural complexes in, in the Black Desert might form the basis of the Jawa uh, uh, culture, um, this is a really interesting uh, um, question um, and, and it would require another lecture. Um, but the, the short answer is, is that I, I don't think it's at all far-fetched. Um, I, I would regard it as, as, as highly um, probable. Uh, and and so, so in Qatafi in particular, um, it, it's quite well known that there are um, early Bronze Age, late Calcolithic, early Bronze Age uh, 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 hilltop um, sites uh, on, on the tops of the Mesas. Um, and these are characterized by um, what, what we refer to as these uh, Aurora huts, which are little two-cell huts. Now, on the top of M7, there is also a, a comparable uh, um, uh, architecture, which includes a, a rough wall around the top of um, the Mesa. However, that does not have uh, Aurora huts, yet it is adjacent to many hundreds of, of late Neolithic structures. Uh, and, and so um, we must consider, I think, the possibility um, that, that we have a sequence of hilltop activity going from the late Neolithic uh, um, up into the late Calcolithic early Bronze Age. Now, linking into Jawa, um, uh, last year I, I was looking at some of the section drawings um, from, from Jawa, and I am beginning to wonder whether the, the actual island of Jawa, uh, in its original unmodified iteration, um, might represent um, a late Neolithic, uh, a, a very simple hilltop site. Uh, and, and, and the thing to bear in mind is, is, is that these hilltop sites have very little in the way of material culture. So if the island of Jawa was being occupied in, in the late Neolithic, we might not see it um, in, in material culture terms, uh, or, or there could just be a bit of residual chipstone uh, 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 knocking about up there from that period. Um, but anyway, the, the, the section drawings from Java are highly suggestive, in, in my view. Um, I'd like to add a little comment on that. Um, and probably York should bring, bring up some comments as well. One of the problems we have out in, um, in the Hara is that we have some pretty good evidence of um, 6,500 to 5,000 BC. But if the early bronze begins at around 35, 3700 BC, we've got that gap of 1,700 years that normally is taken up by the Calcolithic. And as far as I know, we don't have any evidence for the Calcolithic period. And if there is a transition from um, the late Neolithic to the early Bronze Age, I haven't seen it. York, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, there's been, really little evidence. And when we see anything that sort of speaks of that Calcolithic to EB1 period of time, it's always very vague, you know, some dates that could really fall on the cusp between the two, like what Berent Mula Newhoff has, has gotten some of his sites in the more northern Badia. Um, and so, yeah, I haven't seen anything that looks very typically Calcolithic. And this is a common problem, right, with this Calcolithic EB um, period of time, which is a pretty big chunk of time, and so we haven't really seen much, much evidence for it. Um, of course, those dates that we got for the OSL dates from the circles out near Wasad, um, one of those also fell in the Calcolithic EB area, but it was so broad that we can't really place it in one or the other, and it's, it's just the OSL, no real material culture to base it on either. So yeah, it's, it's a bit puzzling. Um, I suspect it's out there somewhere. We just haven't found it yet, but uh, there's not a lot to work with. Okay, I'm going to just ask 
one more question from um, our colleague Louise Martin, who also thanks everyone for their very stimulating presentations. And her question is, are there any vessels or containers that might be used for storage or processing of dairy products? Or are we thinking leather or hide uh, containers? Okay, I, 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 I can um, ha have a go at that one. Um, so so we, we do have pottery um, out uh, at uh, um, Wissad in particular. Um, the diagnostics appear to be Yarmoukian. It begs the question of, of, of where the Wadi Rabba sherds are. Um, because, because we have radio, radiometric evidence for Wadi Raba occupation, but we have no diagnostic pottery that goes with it. Um, however, the amounts are pretty small. Um, we're, we're, we're looking 20 or 30 sherds, and, 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 and then that we, we don't have whole vessels or, or anything that's reconstructable. Um, and, and, and so it, we, we must consider the possibility even um, that, that whole, whole vessels weren't even being taken out there and that the sherds represent, you know, some material that's being used for another purpose. Um, we, you know, we must be open to that. We mustn't necessarily assume uh, um, that these little sherds originally came from whole vessels in, in, in the Black Desert. Um, and, uh, you know, le leather vessels, uh, le leather containers, uh, um, we've got no, no real evidence for it. What we do have, though, is, is uh, um, plaster. Um, so, so M7 SS1 had a, a 40 litre um, plaster container right at the base of the central standing stone. Um, and, you know, that, that, that would certainly hold dairy, um, but it would also hold anything else. It's a, it's a container. Um, Thank you. Thank you. I think... Um... I'm aware there are other questions, so uh, my apologies to those because we've run out of, sadly, run out of time, time now, but I will we'll try and make sure that the speakers get the questions that we have been answered and haven't been answered just for your, for your record. So it, uh, it uh, I'm potentially to answer, <laughs> um, it, uh, it uh, remains for me to thank you all very much. Uh, uh, we're quite a spread out group. We're covering continents here, I'm aware, in, in bringing together our speakers, which is, uh, which is the wonder of being able to do these kinds of, of web webinars. It would be quite hard to do this in another format, except uh, in a conference, perhaps. But I would like to thank you all very much for sharing these latest uh, uh, results from, from your, the Eastern Bardia project. And... Um, and all the best <laughs> for, for the future research. And uh, I assume that you will be back out when you can. I would also like to very much thank uh, Felicity Cobbing and the PEF for joining with us um, when we were discussing uh, who, to, uh, who to invite in this shared lecture. We, we immediately actually <laughs> Uh, thought about the Eastern Bardia because it's a project where we've both been following your activities. It's a CBRL affiliated project as well as receiving um, support from the Palestine Exploration Fund. So uh, thank you very much to you all for agreeing and for coming together this evening. Uh, we hope that all of the audience who joined us this evening, it's been a very popular lecture for us with many familiar uh, names and new names uh, registering. We hope that you've enjoyed today's webinar and that you will look out for other events uh, with CBRL and also PF run uh, quite a number of very uh, inspiring events in London, in London too. Uh, um, and we hope that we will either see you um, again um, in this online format or hopefully sooner rather than later in person too. I'd just like to give a small mention to the next lecture for CBRL is on the 23rd of September and it's a book launch um, on a very contemporary or near contemporary topic of Germany and Israel, whitewashing and state building. Uh, bringing us right up to the 20th century. Um, and thank you all. Um, please uh, 
join the PF's mailing list, join CPRL's um, mailing list. We're both membership organisations and we very much value your support. And we both uh, produce journals in the case of uh, the Palestine Exploration Fund, it's the Palestine Exploration Quarterly, and, and CPRL's archaeological journal is Levant. Um, thank you very much for joining us tonight. Thank you very much to our speakers. Thank you to Felicity, and I'll say good night. <laughs> thank there. you, Carol. Thank you, Felicity. <laughs> thank you. You're everybody, wonderful papers. There's obviously a great deal of room for um, more exploration uh, because it seems to me this area, this, this, inter, this, this kind of interzone between the Levant and Mesopotamia and Anatolia is, is in a way crucial for understanding how ideas, how technologies are, are transmitted. And we don't know that much about it yet. It's a big area. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. It's been fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Cheers.